Hello, this is Sean Owen. I'm a Principal Solutions Architect at Databricks, and I focus on machine learning and data science here at Databricks. And I'd like to tell you today about what it looks like to do machine learning and data science on Databricks from end to end, from the data all the way through the modeling to, to production. And along the way, we'll see how, how this works on Databricks with some of the tools you may have heard of, like Spark and Delta, but also, of course, particularly MLflow. Um, uh, the data science lifecycle has a, a couple steps at least. So there's probably three main parts here. There is the data engineering where we take the raw data and we normalize it, we filter it, we extract what is a, a good representation for the analyst to use. And then the data science takes over, we analyze that data, we explore it, we build models, we select models. And once we've selected the best model, we need to get it out to production in some sense. And the nice thing about Databricks and these tools we're gonna to talk about is they support all steps of this workflow. So I wanna show you today how, how this all fits together. Uh, within Databricks, of course, uh, we're gonna to see today the workspace, which is the piece you, you interact with as a user, but there's a couple interesting pieces under the hood, Spark and Delta, which I alluded to, but also primarily MLflow. I wanna show you how MLflow supports users in, working in the workspace to implement a, a, a data science pipeline from data all the way to production. So I want to go ahead and jump into a, a demo here. And for those that have not seen this particular demo, I hope you enjoy it. For those that have, uh, there are a couple new elements here from maybe the last time you've seen it uh, in MLflow, and I'll highlight those along the way. And with that, uh, let me jump to the demo itself. OK, let's take a look at this demo here. And this is uh, my way of showing you what I think uh, a simple data science problem would look like solved end to end on, on Databricks. So this is Databricks. For those that haven't seen it, it's a hosted web-based service where you interact with a, a notebook-like environment here. So where we can uh, write documentation and markdown, you can write code, which we'll see in a second. And the one thing you don't really have to care too much about is uh, compute resources. So here I've connected to a, an existing cluster. If it was, didn't exist, I could create a, a pretty simple cluster. These clusters scale up and they scale down and um, without you having to think too much about it. So Spark is available. A lot of common libraries are available here and I can just really focus on my work. So in this example, I'm gonna work on a problem that you're probably not working on, but I hope you can um, extrapolate and insert your problem here. But to make it make sense, let me explain what we're gonna look at. We're gonna try and predict life expectancy as a function of health indicators from developed nations in the past mm, 10 or 20 years or so. And we're gonna grab some data from the World Health Organization, the World Bank and our world and data and use it to build a model that predicts life expectancy and see what that tells us about life expectancy. And then we're gonna try and move that to, to production, uh, for example. So let's get started. Uh, we begin, as I said, in the world of the data engineer. That's the first thing we have to do. We have to engineer the, the data. And the, the data here comes in the form of CSV files. They're not that big. Um, none of this would be any different if they, the data source were Parquet files or a database or whatever. Spark can read all of it. I just want to call out that uh, the data engineers, for example, could work in a language like Scala. They can use SQL. They can use uh, Spark directly. And that does not mean the data scientists have to. Now, we'll see later that we're going to switch into Python, even within the same notebook. And that's fine. You can, do, you can mix and match that within Databricks on top of Spark. No problem. So the details of the ETL are frankly not that interesting. Um, I've never met a CSV file that was perfectly formatted. And in this case, we have to do a little bit of work here to massage the data. Uh, to get it in the right form here. Um, we are trying to head for a representation like, like this. So after a little bit of um, manipulation, a little bit of ETL, we're getting something a little more like what we're gonna need for the modeling problem here. We're getting a, a table that's uh, country, year, and a, all these features and values. These are health indicator values. These are demographic values over time. And you can see even here that I've switched into SQL because I can easily query data frames that I'm creating in, with Spark, with Scala, and SQL, if I like. So I can, um, for example, also switch in that view, that table view, into a, a built-in visualization view. So same query. But here I'm looking at life expectancy as a function of time and country. And this is using the built-in visualization in Databricks based on Plotly. So you can see, for example, already uh, that there is an outlier here. The, the life expectancy for one country here is low and declining, whereas others are higher and increasing. And this country is the United States. So we might wonder what's different about the US that would explain that difference in life expectancy. So the data engineers may continue here. They're gonna grab a different data set. And you may have noticed along the way, I'm actually saving off some of these health indicator codes 
in their descriptions as a table because I'm gonna need that later to understand what these column names mean. Let me come back to this in a second because it's important that I'm writing them as a Delta table. More ETL of a second data source, we get it into a similar format, country, year, uh, a bunch of values here, and we're gonna join these a little bit later. Last, not least, we're going to grab a data set of drug overdose deaths by country and year, because that may be relevant. And given these three data sets, the data engineering workflow ends right about here. We're gonna combine them all using SQL here into one data set and write that out as a Delta table. And I do wanna note that over here, we've actually mixed and matched the Spark APIs, SQL and language native UDFs. And that's easy to do in Spark, that's easy to do in Databricks. Um, so it's just that whatever transformation you need to express, you can express it in the most natural language that makes sense and just get on with uh, creating the ETL job. But this, uh, for this example, I'm gonna skip a little bit past the data engineering and assume that this is where the workflow ends. We join all these tables, we have all these features and we're gonna present them to the data scientist for analysis, for modeling and so on. And we're gonna do this by creating a Delta table. We're writing this data as a, as a Delta table and we're actually registering it as well in the Metastore. So if we do this, uh, we will see that in the data tagger and Databricks, these, ta these several tables I'm writing show up and that helps with discoverability, for example. And if we clicked into, for example, the descriptions table, this is this lookup table I was writing. You'll see, for example, uh, the schema, sure, some sample data, but also a history. So uh, Delta tables, unlike most data sets, can be updated, they can be modified. And as they are, that there's a transaction history that's created. So for example, later I could go back and query the results, the state of this table as of a previous point in time, as of a previous version. And maybe that doesn't help too much for this particular lookup table, but it might make a big difference for this um, input table, this so-called silver table that we are creating here for the data scientists. For example, with Delta, the data scientists can come back later and query the data as of two weeks ago to see what the data looked like when they built their model. Delta also ensures that this data set is transactional. So if this ETL job is running one night while the data science uh, inference job is running, no problem, the, the, that job is gonna not read the data in a consistent state, it's going to read a consistent version of the data. There's a couple other interesting things here, like for example, if the data engineering pipeline had a bug and we wrote some bad data here into this input table, well, we could easily roll it back and we could re, um, rerun the ETL pipeline to update it as well. So although Delta is just a storage engine, um, it still is valuable to data scientists because it offers some features that make this table, this interface between data engineering and data science more reliable and more robust. So let's move on to the data science here. Uh, so the data scientists might pick up here, maybe in a separate notebook, although we're here in the same notebook and they could easily use Python, for example. So we've switched to Python here and that's no problem. Uh, this data set is equally readable as a table in PySpark. So we read this data and maybe uh, look at some summary statistics here. We see that, uh, for example, some of these features are entirely missing. You know, they're, they're present in no rows. Some of the features are present uh, only in a, a few of the, the years and countries as well. So we might figure we need to do some in imputation, some inference of the missing values as part of our pipeline here. So let's go ahead and do that as, as data scientists. Now, we could do that in PySpark, no problem, but I'm doing it in Pandas here just to make a point that um, for, for data scientists who are used to Pandas and are used to, to, to the whole Python ecosystem, no problem. You can use Pandas here pretty easily with Spark. And here, for example, I'm gonna take a Spark data frame, uh, bring it down to one machine as a Pandas data frame, and then use Pandas to forward and backfill the missing values by country and by year. I could have done it in Spark, no problem, but I'm just making the point that I can easily do that and then send it back to Spark. Now this would not be a good idea if the, the data set was large, but if it's not, this is totally legitimate. And I'll show you a couple other ways that Pandas interacts and interoperates with Spark later. So as data scientists, maybe the next step is a little bit of exploratory data analysis. Maybe we wanna take this, uh, a couple of key features here and look at how they, how they correlate. Uh, to do that, we might want to make some plots here. And here I'm going to use Seaborn to create these uh, various pair plots between a couple of key features. So Seaborn is a common library for visualization in Python, and it's already built into the machine learning runtime in Databricks. You don't have to install it. If it wasn't installed, it would be easy to install. That's no problem. 
but things like Seaborn that you might commonly use are just already there, they just work. So I create this pair plot and we see things like, well, maybe GDP here is correlated with, uh, this is spending on healthcare, that makes sense. And we also see that uh, deaths from opioid overdoses is, well, there's a clear outlying trend here. And this, this series here in brown is the United States. So we might file that away as well. Maybe that's an explanation of why the US life expectancy is lower. We need to investigate that. Moving along, uh, maybe there's a little more featureization that has to happen between the, the silver table and the final gold table of featureized data that we're gonna build a model on, that we're going to run the model on in production as well to do inference. And here, there's just a little bit of um, one hot encoding that has to happen. So it's, it's not very uh, complicated, but you can imagine this could be more complicated in general. And so this might be an additional data engineering pipeline you need to run repeatedly to get from silver data to this gold table of featureized data that's uh, not just what you built your model on, but what you can apply the model to in production. And we're gonna register that as a delta table as well. So now we're almost ready for a bit of modeling. Uh, so before we get to the modeling, I wanna introduce one other library here called Koalas. And this is for the pandas users out there. So pandas is a common data manipulation tool in the Python ecosystem. And uh, for those that know pandas, but want to use the power of Spark to distribute computation across a cluster, that's where koalas comes in. So you can import koalas and load data from Spark as a koala data frame. And then you get an object that is manipulatable as if it's a pandas data frame. You can apply pandas syntax to it, but all these operations are really happening on this distributed data set. So here I'm just doing something pretty simple. I am splitting the data by year into a, a train and test set. So we're gonna train up to 2014 and we're gonna test after 2014. <clears throat> uh, but you could do more elaborate things with koalas, but here I'm just using it to show that you can use pandas like syntax to manipulate data, even on top of Spark. But this data set's actually pretty small. So we're going to actually realize it as a pandas data set and move on to, to modeling. And you may wonder, well, hmm, is that interesting here? I thought Databricks was about scale. It was about Spark um, and, and, and distributed clustering and computing. And this data set's small enough that building a model on it does not really require uh, a cluster to build the model. But that doesn't mean Spark's irrelevant here. So for example, given this pandas data frame, we could write a little bit of code here to train a model, a regressor with XGBoost to predict life expectancy as a function of these 1,000, 1,600 parameters or so. And that's great. That does not need Spark though, because that's this data set, a small XGBoost can handle this perfectly well on its own. But we do not, uh, we don't build one model. When we build models, we really build hundreds of them because we're not sure what the best settings of all these hyperparameters are, uh, maximum depth, learning rates, uh, regularization, and so on. And normally we would use um, scikit, we'd use SparkML to do a grid search, do a random search over all these parameter combinations. But really, it, it, no matter what, we're building hundreds of models and that can happen in parallel. And because that can happen in parallel, it can happen on, on a Spark cluster. So that's why, for example, in Databricks, we ship and support a tool called HyperOps. It's an open source tool for parameter tuning. So HyperOp can help us um, figure out what the best values are of these hyperparameters. We give it ranges and let it explore. And there's three things that make HyperOp appealing in this case. Uh, number one, it's a Bayesian optimizer. So it um, <clears throat> conducts an intelligent search over the space. It's not gonna bother looking at parameter combinations that haven't worked out well. It's gonna focus its attention on the combinations that seem to be working well and, and do a deeper dive. Second thing it can do is integrate with Spark. So for example, if we uh, use the Spark integration here, then when we run this, um, it's going to actually uh, use the Spark cluster to build these models in parallel, not, not serially on the driver. And we get some speed up there, even though the models themselves, these XGBoost models um, do not know about Spark at all. So there's still some value for Spark, even if uh, your modeling process does not need use it directly. So as we run a tool like HyperOpt um, and try to let it optimize, find the best model. Now we'll see that its best loss goes down, down, down. It's uh, trying different hyperparameters. The best loss, lower is better, is going down, down, down. And the other interesting thing this does over time is to uh, record what it does with HyperOpt, uh, sorry, with MLflow, excuse me. So as it, MLflow uh, HyperOpt runs, <clears throat> it's actually logging everything it does to MLflow. MLflow is this open source 
model tracking and deployment framework from Databricks. And the good news about NMLflow is it integrates with a lot of tools and it can do a lot of stuff for you automatically. So here we really didn't have to do anything with NMLflow, but yet we got all these results here in the, in the, in the, in the experiment for the notebook. I think this is more interesting if we pop this out. Let me switch over here. And so we can see here, for example, the, um, all the, this is 96 or so runs that MLflow created here. We can click into any of them and we can see, for example, in this instance, it, you know, for some hyperparameters, uh, it achieved a certain loss value and so on. This view is not that interesting. I think uh, for parameter tuning, it's more interesting to, for example, select all these and compare all the 96 runs that Hyperopt created. And we can do this with MLflow. So what you're seeing right now is the MLflow tracking server. It's uh, integrated into Databricks. You can run it on your own though. This is, this is actually open source. And we might do a parallel coordinate plot and see, for example, that some of the best runs here with the lowest loss, we can see what their hyperparameters look like and maybe you know figure out that, well, we probably should have looked at lower learning rates, higher min-child weights and so on. But uh, back to the story here, we might take the results of this process, the best hyperparameters, and go ahead and run one more model and log it with MLflow uh, on all the data with the best hyperparameters. And we're gonna do it manually here, but it's really not that hard. So even if you do it manually, you import MLflow, you start a run, that's the unit of logging, you build your model, you log whatever parameters you want, and you log the model, which is really important here. We're logging this XT boost booster. And maybe here uh, we also log a feature explanation plot by a tool called Chap. I'm going to show you the plot later. I will tell you that uh, by the time you see this, I believe MLflow version 112 will support doing this automatically. So even though I had to write a bit of code to do this, um, you will get the plot I'm showing you now for free quite soon. So if we do this, we get this run here. And we can see we logged, you know, the, what were the best, what were the best parameters here, and also uh, the artifact itself, um, some of the environment requirements. So this requires ML, sorry, XTBS one one one, and ML flow. We even logged an example of the the input to the model, which I'll show you in a minute. And we logged this plot here, um, this uh, feature explanation plot, which I will actually probably show you in a second here in the notebook. So we could uh, declare victory and send this artifact here, this pickled file to some uh, DevOps person to deploy and wish them good luck, but we probably want a little more process around that. So um, getting to production means managing the promotion process at least. So that's where the model registry comes in. And if you see the models tab in Databricks, that's, that's the model registry. And so this particular model is probably just the latest instance of many different models we've built um, that implements this service we're trying to build, this life expectancy predictor. And so we've registered this model called, called uh, Gartner 2020. This is for Gartner. And we can see, for example, in our notebook, um, <clears throat> all the various versions of this model that have existed over time. <clears throat> and so let's just focus on the active one. So as we start this uh, example, maybe version 30 is the current production model. And we've just created version 31. And we've registered that as the current staging candidate of this model. Maybe we think we've done better here. And we want to propose this as maybe the next production model. So that's what we do here with MLflow. Now, a couple of things could happen here. Uh, maybe an automated process takes over. Uh, a webhook can trigger that to run a test on the staging candidate. And if it look, the model looks good, we you know, flip the bit and promote it to production. But maybe, uh, certainly for narrative purposes here, maybe we want to do a, a manual sign-off process. So a data science manager could come in load from the registry, the latest product, the latest staging candidate, excuse me, and unpack those artifacts and take a look at the, the plots. Uh, just to answer the question, uh, according to SHAP, this model says that the um, factor that most influences predicted life expectancy is mortality rate from cancer and diabetes. And for countries and years where that mortality rate is high, uh, life expectancy is lower by about well, almost one and a half years. And where it's low, it's higher by almost a year which you know, makes sense, of course. But what we don't see in here is drug overdoses. So apparently that's not really an explanatory factor. It's really just the deaths from cancer and diabetes, um, darkly. So uh, after some more analysis, maybe, maybe the uh, data science manager decides that's fine. We can promote this to production. You can do that with the API. You can do it with the UI as well. So I could have gone in here and 
you know, promoted this model to, to production. And of course, this is all permissionable, so I can control who is allowed to register new versions, who's allowed to transition them, who's allowed to transition to production, and so on. So let's get to production then. Um, so normally, production is kind of a hard part. So we have a model that someone created in the lab, and they send it over to DevOps engineers to implement in production. And that production environment may be totally different. So one thing MLflow does really well is to try to translate that model that you built in the lab to, some, to an artifact that's usable in production. So we built an XGBoost booster, but what we probably need maybe for a batch scoring of the model is a Spark UDF. And MLflow can do that for you. So for example, this could be my production job, the cell here. I load from the MLflow registry the latest production version of this model, not as an XGBoost booster, but as a Spark UDF. This becomes a function that I can apply to data with Spark at scale. And then I read the latest featureized data that's landed in my goal table. Maybe now some data has arrived for 2017 and 18. And I apply it with Spark and that's it. It's no more complicated than that. And I can, for example, um, join this with um, the actuals from previous years and recreate this plot I showed you earlier to show the extrapolation here. So these are the predicted life expectancies according to the model for 2017 and 2018. And this would not have been different if uh, this were a streaming job, no problem. If data is arriving in the stream, you could also do the same thing. Um, this could also be a SQL UDF as well. So you can load these models as Spark UDFs that are usable in Spark SQL as if they're SQL functions as well. Another interesting thing you can do with models is deploy them as real-time services. So uh, you can have MLflow wrap up your service in the Docker container that exposes it as a, as a REST API that responds to JSON formatted requests. You send it inputs, you get an output back. And that can be deployed to your choice of cluster manager, Kubernetes, Azure ML, um, SageMaker, but it's also deployable in Databricks. So I've done that here to my model. Let me open the serving tab here. And so for testing for, for low volume usage, you can actually just deploy this within Databricks as a, as a REST endpoint here. And here's the, the URLs. And I can grab, let me just quickly grab a bit of input, JSON formatted input that would work in this model. And I believe, I hope this will work. Yes. So given that uh, first line of input in the correct JSON format, uh, I can send it to the model and it gives me back a predicted life expectancy of about almost 80 years here. So if you want to deploy your models as a service, no problem, MLflow can do that for you. Um, last, not least, maybe production in MLflow means not a, a batch scoring job, not a REST API, but some kind of dashboard for business users. So maybe we want to give to business users some um, uh, tool where they can explore what the model's saying, maybe uh, evaluate some what-if scenarios. So let's take a look at what life expectancy would have looked like in the US over the years uh, had that light, that uh, mortality rate from cancer and diabetes been different? So if it were low or high, well, how would that have affected the, uh, the life expectancy according to the model? So we can write some code here to load the model, to run these uh, series of predictions, to create this heat map here. But in Databricks, we can also export this as a dashboard like this. And maybe this is easier to share with business users. It's simpler rather than the whole notebook. But we can also instrument this with some widgets as, as here. And uh, we can make the plot update as we update the widgets. So maybe I want to drill a little more. Let me change this to 17. And we'll, as I change it, it reruns the cells. It reruns all the, the scenarios and replots this. And I, I see a, a slightly different plot here. So that really concludes my, my demo here from end to end. We took a couple of data sets. We did some feature engineering. In, uh, with Spark in Databricks. We managed the, those, those features with Delta. We did data science and used some third-party plotting libraries and so on to explore the data. We used tools like uh, HyperOp to parallelize our model selection process with XGBoost on top of Spark. And once we got that best model, we logged it with MLflow and we used MLflow and the registry to manage its transition from say test or staging to production. And once we got to production, we showed how you can grab that model and do uh, simply deploy it as a, as a batch job, as a streaming job, as a REST API, or even maybe as a dashboard as well. So I hope this has been helpful. I hope that um, you can see how this might apply. This pattern might apply to whatever models you are going to build. 
and I hope you uh, try DemoFlow and get started today. Thank you.